this is one of the central themes of the New Testament, that a Christian is a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. So even though you're not good at dancing, you can still be a disciple of Jesus if you follow him. So right from the very beginning of the gospel, for example, we take John chapter 1. It says in verse 36, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The following day, verse 43, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. So right from the beginning, people were following Jesus. He was calling out for those that were listening to him, come, follow me. Shortly after that, one day Jesus was by the Sea of Galilee, and he helped Peter and Andrew and the rest of the fishermen with a miracle catch. And then in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 19, he said to them, follow me. What was Jesus saying? Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. That means here on, you're not only going to be productive in your career, you're going to be productive on the things of the kingdom. And that's God's desire for us. Amen. Their response was without hesitation. They immediately left their nets and they followed him. So for most of us Christians, we don't literally have to leave our jobs or our career, put everything behind, and go into full-time ministry. I mean, we don't have to do that. But there must be a total inner surrender of everything to put Jesus Christ first. Amen? We must not follow any ambition or any earthly attachment and allow them to occupy first place in our lives. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So here, Jesus asked them to follow him, and they did. Now, next verse, verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately, again, no hesitation, they left the boat and their father and followed him. So these men, Andrew, Peter, James, John, Philip, and, and the rest, they were thoroughly convinced that following Jesus would change their lives forever. And there were others. For example, someone like Matthew. A few chapters later, Matthew chapter 9, and in verse 9, one day Jesus passed on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. He said to him, what did he say? Follow me. Can you see? He's always saying that. Follow me. Follow me. You follow me. So he arose and followed him. Here was Matthew, a tax collector, a corrupt sinner. And people were shocked that Jesus that very same evening, went to his house to have a dinner with a well-known, terrible, terrible man. But you see, that's the beauty of following Jesus. Nothing you have done could make him love you more. Nothing you have done could make him shut the door. Jesus will accept us as we put aside, or put aside all our sins and all our weaknesses and come following him. Now, that's the beginning of the gospel. When you come to the middle of the gospel, what was Jesus doing? One day, Jesus proclaimed. He spoke to them. He said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will no longer walk in darkness, for the light of life will be in him. John chapter 8 and verse 12, right? So Jesus was still calling out for the same thing. you got to follow me. you got to follow me. Now we come to the end of the gospel. You come to the last chapter in the book of, of John. John chapter 21. And this was right after the crucifixion. Right after the resurrection. Jesus met his disciples again. This time by the Sea of Galilee. But by the shore of it. Peter and the rest were discouraged. And they were back fishing. Casting their nets. And again they could catch nothing. Jesus again helped them with a miracle catch. And then immediately John recognized who this person was. He said, hey guys, it's, it's the Lord. 
is Jesus. And then Peter just dived into the, into the sea and swam towards him and came to the shore. Now, knowing that Peter was nervous and feeling inadequate, Jesus asked him three times. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times is Jesus talking to him now? Three times. Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you really, really love me? Now, each time, Jesus was encouraging him. Jesus was trying to recalibrate his life and say, Peter, you're going to take care of the people. You're going to take care and be the pastor of the first church. And he was assuring him that God's grace was still there for him. God's grace is going to equip you, Peter. God's grace is calling you, and that grace will never fail you. And friends, Jesus prophesied to Peter, you will never deny me again. Peter, you may have done it three times, but it's not going to happen again. One day when you are old, you're going to lay down your life for me the way I laid down my life for you on the cross. And so in verse 19, we go all the way to the end of the gospel. John 21, verse 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, Jesus said to him, follow me. See, he's saying those words again. Follow me. Three verses. Jesus repeated what he just said. If I want you to remain alive till I return, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Peter, you must follow me. You must do what? Follow me. Following Jesus. From the beginning of the gospel to the end of the gospel, you find Jesus Christ repeating those words to Simon Peter and to all the rest. You got to follow me. You got to follow me. You must follow me. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right in front behind you this time and say, you must follow Jesus. Right. You must follow me, Peter. And every step of the way, there were challenges. And let me tell you, there will be challenges in your life as you follow him. Peter stumbled and fell many times. But each time, Peter know this, I will keep on following and he never stopped following. Peter must follow Jesus and he did. And this was his testimony at the end of his life. Peter said, I believe Peter 1 verse 21, to this you were called because Jesus Christ suffered for you, leaving us an example to follow that we should follow in his footstep, right? Because Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So in spite of his many failures, many challenges, Simon Peter went on to do great, great things, amazing things. And let me tell you, this is your destiny too. You may have challenges, Oh, go ahead and give God a big hand. Hallelujah. This is your destiny. This is our destiny. There will be challenges. There will be stumbling and falling along the way. But just like God's grace was sufficient for Simon Peter and for all the rest of the disciples, it will be sufficient for you and for me. So when we come to the end of the end, so you have seen the beginning of the gospel, the middle of the gospel, the end of the gospel, the testimony of Simon Peter, now 60 years into the future. God came to the apostle John and gave him a glimpse of the end of the end. This is the end of time. And in a vision, John saw multitudes, millions and billions standing before the throne of God. And it says in Revelation 14 and verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Can you see that? Right? All those who are called to follow Jesus, they are going to stand before the throne of God. 
And this will be the characteristics of those that's going to make it in glory. Followers of Jesus Christ. You must follow me. You must follow me. Jesus says, you must follow me. And that is the constant refrain, the constant word of Christ all throughout the word. So let's be very clear tonight because tonight is going to be the, the starting point of what I want to share with you much throughout the rest of this year. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? If you're going to follow him, you've got to know what it means, right? To follow a person means to pursue a person, to imitate a person, to shadow him, to, clo to stay close behind, to be where he's at, to do what he does. That's what it means to, to follow a person. It means to conform to him, to be like him in character, in behavior, in attitudes, in, in um, disposition, affections. How Jesus feels, I'm going to feel the same way. How Jesus uh, disposes himself, I'm going to dispose myself the same way. Whatever virtues and values that's in Jesus Christ, I'm going to have the same values. I'm going to have the same virtues. And this is God's ultimate desire for you and I. That we imitate Jesus. That we become more and more like Jesus Christ in every dimension, aspect of our lives, every single day. Now, let me show you a, quick, a few quick scriptures. I, I want to show you so that you're very clear about this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Can we just look at Ephesians 1 and verse 4? And here, Paul says, Just as he, that is God the Father, chose us in him, Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? We should be holy and without blame before him in love. So you see this? Way back in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, before time began, before God created the universe or even the angels, God already has a desire. Way, way back. Way, way back. Eternity, past, past, past. God's desire is that one day He will have a people, He will have children who are like Him, holy and blameless, without blame, before him now why holy because holiness is the very nature of God again and again the Bible says God says be holy for I am holy right you got to be holy because God is holy it's, it's very nature yep so practically what does it mean to be holy I mean when we talk about holiness what does it actually mean well there's another scripture, Romans chapter 8, and this is identical to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. This is an identical verse. So you have a clear understanding scripture, confirming scripture. It says in verse 29, For whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, predestination means God has chosen us before time began. So before the world was created, that is in Ephesians 1, now is before time began. God has already predestined you and I, chosen us beforehand, and he wanted us to be like Jesus. So when you put Ephesians 1 and Romans chapter 8 together, it becomes very clear. Holiness means Christ-likeness. Holiness is to be like Jesus Christ. Holiness and Christ-likeness are synonymous. If you want to be holy, it's not a matter of what you don't wear, what you don't eat, what you don't drink. You know, if you don't color your hair, you're going to be holy. You don't put on makeup, you're going to be holy. Now, we have passed all that already, right? Holiness doesn't mean what you don't do or what you do. Holiness is to be like Jesus Christ. You can abstain from many things, 
Don't color your hair. Don't put on makeup. Never wear jeans. Don't visit the cinema. Not going to movie theater or, movie, or cinema for years and years on end. And yet, if you're not like Jesus Christ, you're not holy. The qualifier, the qualification for holiness is to be like Jesus. So to be holy means to imitate Jesus Christ in his attitudes, in his affections, in his disposition, in his virtues, in his values. Holiness and Christ-likeness are synonymous. So if Christ-likeness is God's desire for us, for you and I, from the very beginning, what is God doing right now today? What is God up to with your life, with my life? What is God up to in City Harvest Church? Well, the Bible is very clear. It says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now look at this verse, look at this verse. You know what it means? It means that at this present time, today, 1st of February 2020, so make sure you have 2020 vision concerning this. Make sure you see very clearly here. God right now, every single day as we look at the mirror of the Word, the Word of God is like a mirror. Every day when we look in the mirror of the Gospels, we see Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see how Jesus acted. We see how Jesus behaved. We see the heart of Jesus, his affections, his disposition, his virtues. When we look at Jesus Christ, and then we look at the epistles, what the, the, the different writers say about Jesus, because the epistles are expansion of Jesus' words in the Gospel. When we look in all this, the Holy Spirit comes along and then transform us to what we have read and know concerning Jesus Christ. So that you and I become more Jesus-like in everything that we do. So th throughout everything that happened, the good, the bad, the ugly, the good things, the challenging things, the sometimes it feels the God-forsaken things, God is making us more and more Jesus-like, more and more Christ-like. Oh, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Don't just clap a little bit. You want to clap, then give God a big clap. Hallelujah. So we know Romans 8, 28, 29. All things work together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose. And what's that purpose? To conform to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Everything that has happened is to make us more like Jesus. It's to make you more like Jesus. All right? Now, because this is God's ultimate purpose for us in this time and ultimately in the very end. So when you come to the end of the end, what's God's purpose for you and I? Well, the Bible is also very clear. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. How many of you are children of God? Just wave your hands at me. Hallelujah. Amen. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So, how are we going to be, how is the end of the end going to be like? We don't know a lot. I mean, we know some, from the book of Revelation, which I hope you'll come and learn from it. But we don't know everything, how heaven is really, really like. You know, what's going to happen over there? We don't know, we don't have a full picture. The Bible doesn't give us a full picture. But that's not important. What is important is this. But we know that when we, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So when we meet Jesus Christ, we are going to be completely, completely, totally Jesus-like. So God is preparing us today for that great day. We are slowly being transformed every single day through the good things, the bad things, the God-forsaken things. Slowly, the Holy Spirit 
changing us, transforming us for moving to that day when we meet the Lord and Jesus will come back soon. Either we'll die to go and meet him or he's going to come back soon. And when we see him, we are going to be like him. So from the very beginning of the plan, well, very beginning, the plan is to conform us to the image. Right now, every single day, we are being transformed into the image. When we see him, we shall be like him. Now you want to clap. Go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what all these means? All these means that our first, 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 first calling, your first, 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 first calling, is not to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Your first, 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 first calling is not, if you're in ministry, it's not just to build a great church, have a great cell group, to win thousands of millions of people to Jesus Christ. I mean, all those things are great. But that's not your primary calling. It's not to be a church builder, or if you're in the marketplace, to be a marketplace leader. To be captains of industries. It's great to be successful, but that's not your first calling. Our first, 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 first calling is not even to be a good husband or a good wife. Or to be a good father or a good mother. To be a good parent. And parenting is very good. It's very necessary because we are planning for the future. But you've got to realize this. Your vocation is not your number one calling. My vocation is not the number one calling. I mean, it's great to be a senior pastor of City Harvest Church, but that is not my number one calling. Our first and primary calling is to be like Jesus. You got to get this burn into your spirit tonight. 1 John chapter 2, and how many of you here tonight, you're born again in Jesus Christ and you're proud of it, lift up both hands and shout a little bit. Right. 1 John 2 verse 6, whoever claims to live in him, that means if you are living in Christ, you must live as Jesus did. You got to live as Jesus did. You got to be like him. You must follow him. And be like him in every dimension and aspect of your life. Like him. Totally, totally like Jesus. If you're going to be like Jesus, that we read about in action in the gospel stories, we are to think like him, imitate his example, follow his example in every detail in our lives. If we're going to be like Jesus, in his purity, in his devotion, in his love, you got to love like Jesus. In his humility, Jesus is so humble. In his obedience, in his faith, in his power, and Jesus is very powerful. And even in his suffering, yes. Well, this year I'm going to show you a, a picture of Jesus. Because, you know what? If you can't see who Jesus is, how are you going to know him? If you don't know him, how are you going to be like him? So you got to see very clearly, 2020, right? Got to have a 2020 vision. A clear vision of who Jesus Christ is like. So yes, got to be like him in his faith, in his power. Even if he's suffering. Suffering. Oh, I don't like to be like Jesus in his suffering. Hey, what have we just read? 1 Peter 1 21. Right? To this you were called. Because Jesus also suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Did Jesus Christ suffer? Yes, he did. And he's calling us to suffer victoriously with him. So in, in the midst of his suffering, Jesus never once lost his victorious spirit. So do we believe in blessing? Absolutely. You are blessed and you're coming in. You're blessed and you're going out. But we also believe in suffering for the sake of Christ. So in the midst of your blessing, you will suffer. But you suffer victoriously. And in the midst of your suffering, you'll be blessed. In fact, very often, your greatest blessing will be found in the midst of your greatest suffering. Oh, you believe that? Give the Lord a big hand. Come on, clap your hands. Let the Lord know you love Him. Hallelujah. 
This is God's will for us to be like Jesus. His will for you and for me. It is that simple to be Jesus-like. So simple. But it's also that difficult. It's going to be the most difficult thing you have ever done before in your whole life. As I'm discovering it every single day. As I'm discovering being like Jesus is not so easy. And by our own strength, it's practically impossible. Just cannot be done. Just cannot be done. Without the Holy Spirit, it's not possible. That is why we need the Holy Spirit every single day. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to transform us day by day. So Christ-likeness is the number one priority for New Testament Christianity. It was Paul's number one concern. And it's my primary goal and concern as your senior pastor. It's my primary goal. Galatians chapter 4 verse 19, this is what Paul is saying. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. This is the highest goal of church ministry. There cannot be anything higher than this. This is my greatest challenge. My greatest challenge. It's not just to have numbers in the church or great events and great programs. Those things are important. My number one challenge, and this is going to be my biggest task for the second half of my life, is to see that Jesus Christ be formed in every single one of you, from the first row to the last row, from the left to the right. This is the most important thing, to form Christ-likeness in every believer. And that is your job as a cell group leader. That is your job as a church staff. That is your job if you're running a fellowship in your office, wherever you may be. That is the, the highest goal. And again, I say, my goal, therefore, this year is to make Jesus Christ very clear to you because the principle of discipleship is, is very straightforward. The clearer the picture of Jesus you see, the purer your discipleship will be. Yeah? The, oh, go ahead and praise God. Hallelujah. The purer our vision of Christ, the poorer our discipleship will be. If you can't see Jesus, then you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, how are you gonna be like Jesus? So I don't want you to waste your whole life running helter-skelter, looking for shelter, going through all the, the routine of a, a religious Christian life and miss the big picture. And what is the big picture? Jesus. So how many of you want to be like Jesus one more time? Put up your hands, right? Okay, right. Let's roll our sleeves. Let's get ready to work. Because from today, we have a goal. Our goal in 2020 is to have a clearer picture of Jesus Christ. And this year, in every sermon that I preach, I hope I paint a clearer picture for you. So let's be very clear. The character profile, this is how Jesus is like. The character profile of Jesus Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the Jesus that we see in action in the Gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A Jesus overflowing with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, He lives His life in us every single day. Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, but every day He lives His life in you and in me through the Spirit, by the Spirit, right? Over and over again, He's living through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Holy Spirit has another name. It's called the Spirit of Christ, yeah? The more you let the Holy Spirit work in you, the more like Christ you become. The more like Jesus you become. And if we allow Him, the Holy Spirit will every day transform us to be Jesus-like. Christ-likeness is the fruit of the Spirit. You heard me mention this at the anniversary. You, you heard Pastor Bob talk about it a few weeks ago. And we can't talk enough. 
We can't emphasize this enough. The more Christ-like we are, the more we see the display of the fruit of the Spirit in us. And let me tell you, it is very hard to grow the fruit of the Spirit. Very hard. Without the Holy Spirit, impossible. Right? Now, what are the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5. Can we all read together? Verse 22 to verse 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no, no. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law, right? The nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is the description, the total description of Jesus' character, his affections. He's very loving. He's very kind. He's good all the time. This is his disposition. He's long-suffering. He's very forbearing. He's full of self-control. This is his virtues. If I want to profile myself, if I want to know, am I growing or not? Am I becoming holier or not? Am I becoming like God? I don't have to go any further. I just compare myself to this list in Galatians 5. I just check. Am I full of love, joy, peace? Am I full of long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Do I have them in my life? This is the profile of Jesus Christ. This is Jesus' automatic response under pressure. <coughs> easy to be loving. Easy to be kind. But when you are under pressure all the time, when you are under stress, is this the fruit that's in display? Joy, uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self -control. Is this, are these coming forth? Or is it something else? Maintaining all these under pressure is very hard. I want to be frank with you. It's very hard. I've been a Christian now for almost 46 years. And I can tell you now, it's still the hardest thing to, for me to achieve every single day. And without the Holy Spirit, it is not possible. When people act maliciously against you, and you are still supposed to smile and be loving. <laughs> Very hard. It's not natural. I mean, somebody stab you in the back. You turn around, I love you. I mean, this is, come on. Come on, pastor, give me a break. I know, I know. It is impossible. It's impossible, right? I mean, you know, when circumstances are sad and depressing, like Jesus, we are to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. I mean, how, how are you going to do that? When we face trouble and anxiety, we have to stay in peace and remain calm and not worry and not be anxious very hard. Who can do this? Impossible. That's why we urgently need the Holy Spirit every single day. And because, let me tell you, without the fruit of love, you will never be filled to the full measure of who God is. You know what I mean? We can grow by faith and move in power to a certain extent and then you face a wall. Because you can't break through the ceiling of power and faith, unless you're filled with the measure of the fullness of God, and that can't happen unless you have the fruit of, the, of love. Without the fruit of joy, you can never walk in God's strength because the joy of the Lord is my strength. That is why when you look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 18, I believe, Jesus was faced with so much stress, and yet the Bible says he's full of joy through the Holy Spirit. You go back and read. Luke 10 verse 21. Full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Joy is a supernatural gift that comes from heaven above. It's the joy of the Lord. 
It's the joy of the spirit. Life and people can be very disappointing. You don't believe it to be true? Come and serve God in full-time ministry, you'll find out. <laughs> Life and people can be very disappointing. But we don't want to lose the fruit of kindness. Or to become cynical or jaded. You know, when you're jaded by life, you lose enthusiasm. You just lose enthusiasm. You don't want to serve. You don't, know, you don't want to meet people. You don't want to face people. And we can get very opinionated and very cynical and very gossipy. Because we are disappointed again and again and again. And we forget that when all is said and done, it is still kindness that leads people to repentance. Yeah. Oh, go ahead and praise God. Hallelujah. No one is hurt more than Jesus Christ. No one. He's hurt by all the sin that have ever been committed, past, present, and future. No one is betrayed more than our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, you think that you've been betrayed many times. You cannot compete with Jesus. <laughs> but he constantly walk in an atmosphere of forgiveness. Always forgiving. Always kind. Always. Can you imagine? On the night when he was betrayed, he was washing the feet of his traitor. Wow. I mean, this is... This is this is the, the type of kindness we're talking about. He's the Lord of all, yet he lowered himself to be your servant and mine. This is the kindness we're talking about. When we are tempted to do wrong, and every day we face temptation, can we maintain the fruit of goodness and purity that we are good all the time, and all the time we are good? Very hard. When you're tempted, when you're not tempted, of course you are good. When you are tempted, all the goodness is out the window. I mean, how to be good all the time? But because Jesus said, I don't condemn you, but please go and sin no more. And Jesus is sinless. To be like him means we don't want to live in sin anymore. How to do that? Every single day we sin. When situations provoke us to react and retaliate, can we maintain the fruit of long-suffering, gentleness, self-control? Because it's gentleness that makes us great. We are so great. You are so great because God is so gentle to you. And He expects you to be gentle to the rest. Jesus may get angry, but never once He lost His cool. Never once he lost his temper. When I realize this, I say, oh my God, I'm so far away from Jesus. I'm so far away from Jesus. I could go on and on and on. Because not one fruit of the Spirit is natural to us. They are all supernatural. They are all out of this world. Supernatural graces from the Most High from on high, the supernatural. Only God can form that in us. Let me give you an example. One of the hardest things to do in life is to be long-suffering. I mean long-suffering. The word alone, you don't like it, long-suffering. <laughs> you know what it means to be long-suffering? You can check the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic. Long-suffering means suffer a long, long time. <laughs> Who likes to suffer a long time? You gotta be crazy if you like long I mean, if you like to suffer a long time. Let me tell you what it means to be long-suffering. It means you are patiently enduring. Enduring. Now that is the passive part. That is the, just, there are two parts. That's just the passive part. You endure and you endure patiently and you endure and you endure some more. But you see, that's not all there is to long-suffering. There's an active part. Enduring is only the passive part. The active part is you persevere. That means you keep on doing what God wants you to do. So you keep on smiling. <laughs> you keep on doing good. You keep on giving. You keep on praising. 
You keep on reading the Bible, you keep on praying, you keep on fasting. I mean, enduring is one thing. But to keep on keeping on, hey, that is a totally different ball game. Christ-likeness means even when life is unbearably painful, it's so painful, it's unbearable, you remain in love, you remain in, in peace, you remain in joy, you remain in kindness, and you don't lose your goodness, you don't lose your faithfulness, you don't lose your gentleness or your self-control. You don't lose all that. That is why it means to be long-suffering. Oh, come on, give God a big hand. Hallelujah. Humanly impossible. It can only happen to the supernatural power of the Spirit. But this habit of long-suffering, it's a habit that you got to cultivate. Patient endurance. Patient perseverance. It is essential for your holiness. Because if you don't have long-suffering, you cannot be Christ-like. If you're not Christ-like, you're not holy. If you have no long-suffering, you can never be mature. You can never grow up in the things of God. When I have a revelation of this, the last two and a half years, when life was unbearable on so many levels, and I saw this, I got horrified. I say, I'm so far from Jesus. I'm so far from Jesus. I don't like that old Kong. Because that old Kong, it's not long suffering. The old Kong is very temperamental. I like to get angry all the time. Every aspect of the fruit of the Spirit goes against every inclination we have as a human. Many of us already find it difficult to express love. I mean, we are not just talking about, just talking about being normal, right? Many of you already find it hard to hug somebody, not just because there's a Wuhan virus, but you just find it hard. You already find it hard even to smile because of your temperament. You're just not that tight. Yeah? You already find it hard to, um, uh, because of your upbringing, all right? I mean, you, you grow up in a family, there's not a lot of expression of love. You already find it hard to love. And not forgetting, one in five people struggle with clinical depression. I mean, we're saying just being a human is tough. <laughs> and yet, you're supposed to be loving. Some of us, we are born warriors. We worry, worry all the time. It's just our temperament. Some are hot-tempered, easily irritable, type A personality type. I mean, type A, you know, choleric, right? And, and, and we pride ourselves, you know, what do you expect? I'm a pastor of a big church, you know, of course I deserve the right to be angry. <laughs> I'm a boss of a big company. So the bigger your organization, the bigger your temper. <laughs> hey, come on. You know, I mean, what do you expect? I got to be excellent, spear excellence. We, we excuse ourselves, you know, we, we have, we got to be stay focused. So if I'm focused and I want to have a spear excellence, I have a right to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> but when I look in the Bible and see how Jesus was, I say, hey, Jesus is not like that. Jesus is not like that. I mean, many of us can be so sarcastic and cutting our words. We, we, we have black belt in sarcasm. <laughs> you know, we're so sarcastic. We're so good in, in, in cutting people. And all of us, oh, come on. We, all of us struggle with temptation of every kind. I mean, I read a report. It says 50% of men struggle with pornography. Imagine that. If, if you are a man and you're not struggling with it, the guy next to you is struggling. 50%, right? Oh, don't look around. Don't look around. There's very little purity or goodness in us. So changing the habits that's natural to us to become Christ-like, it requires a total internal reconstruction. A total internal rebuilding. 
And I believe 2020, this is the year we are going to go through a total internal reconstruction because God is working in us to be more like Jesus. Come on, give God a big clap. You'll believe that. So you got to deliberately from today, from today, from this service, from right now, you got to deliberately set yourself. You got to calibrate your heart. From today, I have one goal, and that's to be like Christ. And you learn every day to walk with the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, and keep on acting out these nine graces, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, uh, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You keep on acting out until it becomes your second nature until this becomes your eternal habit because eternally in heaven it's going to be like that if you're not the patient long-suffering kind heaven going to be miserable for you you're the only one losing temper and everybody else is not <laughs> you're going to be so uncomfortable there you're going to start acting out every day every day I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be kinder by the Spirit. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to have long suffering. I'm going to have goodness. I'm going to have self control. You're going to act this out by the power of the Spirit until it's out of character if you're not loving. It is out of character. Not like you. Hey, what happened to you, Kong? What happened to you? You know, it's not like you not to be kind. It's not like you not to have self control. It's out of character if you're not. not living out and displaying the knife fruit of the Spirit. So every day, you got to surrender yourself more and more to the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit is free to be able to do and work in you so that you will and do what is pleasing to God. Oh, come on, go ahead and give God a big hand. Both to will and do for His good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. So I'm going to close by saying this. I'm going to close by saying this. Following and imitating Jesus Christ. Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. You must follow me. It simply means you got to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this is greater and more important than any success you can achieve in your life, in your career, in your ministry. When we understand this, Suddenly, we read passages in the Bible that Jesus mentions certain things. It suddenly, it takes on a new meaning, and everything makes sense. For example, in John 15, I know Pastor Bob mentioned this. I, I got worried. I thought he's preaching my sermon, but never mind. John 15, verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. When you understand this, you will not read it with an understanding. Oh, God wants me to be productive and to bear fruit in my career, in the marketplace, in my ministry, to grow cell groups, to get soul safe. He's talking not about that. He's talking about you need to bear the fruit of the Spirit in you. Because if you abide in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are in the Spirit. And the Spirit of Christ will bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in you. All right, go on. A, little, a few verses down, verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. It cannot be that if you have five cell groups, oh, that proves you're a disciple of Jesus. It cannot be if you have 10 companies, oh, it proves you're so productive, you must be a disciple of Jesus. It cannot be, right? For all you know, you're not even a Christian. Yeah. So we are his true disciples. When we bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, yeah, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Yeah. So, and then he says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So why does God always answer Jesus' prayers? Because Jesus is so much like his father. His prayer is always, always according to his will. 
So wherever Jesus asks, God the Father always answers. Similarly, the more Christ-like, Jesus-like you and I are, the more God will answer our prayers. But if we are angry all the time, we are unloving, we are unkind, we are unforgiving, or we are walking in morality, impurity, no goodness in us, and we pray, God, deliver me. And we wonder, how come the prayer answers doesn't come? Because the Bible says, if you cherish iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. In City Harvest Church, we all love the kingdom of God. How many of you love the kingdom of God? Yeah. I, I, my eyesight is failing me. How many of you love the kingdom of God? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> praise God. For a moment, momentarily, I thought I'm in the wrong church, yeah. <laughs> Every day we pray, Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. But you got to realize this. The kingdom of God takes the character of the king. So the atmosphere of heaven, the atmosphere of heaven, I mean, we pray, we let the atmosphere, the atmosphere of God is in this place. We want the atmosphere of heaven to come to City Harvest Church, come into our family. What is the atmosphere of heaven? The atmosphere of heaven is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the atmosphere of love. It's the atmosphere of joy. It's the atmosphere of peace. It's the atmosphere of long-suffering and forbearance. It's the atmosphere of kindness and goodness and, 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 and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It's filled with who He is. That's the atmosphere of heaven. From today, this is what I want all of you to do, and I'm speaking to you as your pastor. You must develop a taste for the fruit. You know, I never like fruits. Son, when I grew up, son would tell you, I don't like fruits. I just don't like fruit. Give me the meat, give me the rice, give me everything else. Just don't give me the fruit. I skip fruit. But last two and a half years, you don't have fruit, you have no vitamins. So I began to develop a taste. My goodness, I got, when I came back home, everybody got shocked. Pastor, you're eating a lot of fruits. It's an acquired taste. <laughs> you must develop a taste for the fruit of the Spirit. You must start loving it and having it every single day. Oh, go ahead and praise God. Hallelujah. You must long for it. You must desire it. You must hunger for it. Otherwise, you'll not be very comfortable in heaven. Because heaven is full of everything the fruit of the Spirit signifies. And this is what we want to see in City Harvest Church. Let's all stand on our feet today. I tell you, the presence of God is here. The presence of God is in this place. Everybody just open your mouth and begin to pray in the spirit right now from the front to the back. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, let's just pray. 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 From, the, from our hearts, from the depth of our spirit, it's deep calling unto the deep. Jesus is calling us to follow him afresh. Follow him afresh. Follow him afresh. Come follow me. Come and be like me. Come and be Jesus like, be Christ like in who you are, in how you see life. Be, be Jesus like in your disposition, in your affections. Be able to love like Jesus love. Be Jesus like in your virtues, in your values, in your character, in your behavior. It's the atmosphere of heaven. Come Holy Spirit, come Spirit of the living God Come and move among us from the front to the back Just open up your hearts today Just open up your hearts today Something wonderful is happening in this place I give my voice to sing you praise No matter what life may be my way that you are the God of my life. You are the one who holds it all. I lift my hands to worship you. Nowhere to find a love so true.
of God and we put ourselves and face the mirror of the word and we see our own internal reflection we can't really say that we are truly loving can't really say that we're walking in the joy of the Lord the situation of the world make us unhappy all the time but let me tell you you can be the most unhappy person and yet rejoicing in God every single day because while happiness is a result of circumstances, joy comes from heaven. In the presence of the Spirit is fullness of joy. How many of you today, you said, Pastor, I can be more loving. I can rejoice in God more and more every single day. How many of you here today, you said, I'm not, I'm not really walking in peace. I'm worrying all the time. I need to develop the fruit of peace and composure and trust God more every single day. I can just let go and let God more. How many of you, when you, when you look at the mirror of the Word and you say, hey, I, I'm not really so long-suffering. I, I have a very short span of endurance. I know I'm supposed to persevere, but I feel like giving up. And that's why we need to mature and grow. And God is... He's not angry with us. He just wants us to see who we really are and, and, and surrender our lives, that area to the Holy Spirit so we can come and empower us. Not to condemn us, but empower us. And we yield to that grace as we surrender to Him. And you'll find the fruit of long-suffering, endurance, perseverance, patience begin to grow in your life. You know, this amazing gift God has given to us in our human mind. Whatever we focus on, we can achieve that. If we focus to develop on the fruit of, of long-suffering, the Holy Spirit comes and helps us in that area. How many of you said, Pastor, I'm, I'm not so kind. I'm not such a kind person. I'm not so forgiving. I, I want the Holy Spirit to change me. I, it's kindness that leads people to repentance. It's kindness, His goodness changes me. I want to be kind. And I want to walk in purity and goodness. I don't want to struggle in sin, in immorality, whether big sin or small sin. I, I want to be free from all those bad habits. How many of you say today, God, please come and help me. I need you to work in me in the area of faithfulness. I'm not very loyal. I'm not very committed. Not faithful to you. Not faithful to my family. Not faithful to my spouse, to my friends. I need greater faithfulness. Or maybe you need uh, greater gentleness. You're not so gentle. You, you know, maybe like, uh, like me. <laughs> like me in the past. Used to lose my cool, lose my temper. I don't like that. I don't like that old Kong. I pray, oh God, every single day you, you, you crucify that Kong on the cross. Don't let that Kong come out again. Maybe you're like that. You've got anger issues. You've got temper problems. You lose your cool all the time. Friends, there's no excuse. That's not the character of Jesus. 
Sometimes you can be angry. And sometimes there's righteous anger. But there's no excuse for losing your temper. There's no excuse for losing your cool. How many of you here today, you say, God, I want to be more like you. Come and form the fruit of the Spirit, the, full, the fruit of gentleness in me. It's your gentleness that make me great. It's my gentleness that will make my family great. It's my, it's my gentleness that will make my church, my friends, my office great. God, help me to be more gentle like you. How many of you here today, maybe you need more self-control in your life. And there are areas you, know, you have no control over alcohol, gambling drugs you have no control over that and to that tonight you say oh god i want to have greater self-control pornography immorality all those things you say god i want to be more like jesus i want to be holy like jesus i want to be pure like jesus i want to be jesus like every single day come on let's just lift our hearts lift our hands just open your mouth and begin to pray in the spirit right now Everybody prays from the front to the back, to the left to the right. Something great is happening. you to humble yourself and humble your heart we come before a great God a universe who love us so much that even before time began he already decided that he loves you that he has chosen you the fact that you're standing here tonight in the house of God in his holy place is because God a long time ago has already called and chosen you not only that you'll be safe but that you'll be holy and blameless before Him. And by that, He meant that you will be exactly like Jesus Christ. Every single day, He fills you with the Holy Spirit. He draws you by the Spirit. He draws you by the power so that internally there will be a reconstruction and a change. Every single day, you become more like Jesus. A little bit here, a little bit there. More like Him in your character, your behavior. More like Him in your attitudes, more like Him in your affections, more like Him in your disposition, your values, your virtue, changing you, transforming you, and ultimately one day you're going to stand before Him. The moment you see Him, the moment you open your eyes and see Jesus, you'll be exactly like Him. It's talking tongues all over this place. God is working something deep in your hearts today. Allow him, allow him. Don't fight the spirit. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Say, dear God, dear God, change me. Dear God, know me. Come, Holy Spirit.
I want you to say this prayer right now from the front to the back, from the left to the right. I want, you, I want this to be your prayer and your cry. But before we do that, how many of you want to be more Jesus-like in your life? That's you just lift up your hands right now. Okay, let's all say this prayer then. We all come before God. We all humble ourselves before the presence of God, all right? Let's all say this out loud together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. You want me to be more like Jesus. You want me to be more like Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for sending the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for sending the Holy Spirit. Help me to be more loving. Help me to be more loving. Help me to be kinder. Help me to be kinder. Help me to have more peace. Help me to have more peace. To rejoice in the Lord all the time. To rejoice in the Lord all the time. Help me to suffer a long time. Help me to suffer a long time. To be able to endure. To be able to endure. And persevere. And persevere. By the power of the Spirit. By the power of the Spirit. Help me to walk in goodness and purity. Help me to walk in goodness and purity. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. I reject every impurity in me. I reject every impurity in me. Every habitual sin. Every habitual sin. I renounce you right now. I renounce you right now. I command you to leave my life. I command you to leave my life. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Purify my heart. Purify my heart. Change my heart. Change my heart. Help me not to walk in sin. Help me not to walk in sin. Help me to be faithful. Help me to be faithful. Help me to be gentle. Help me to be gentle. To have self-control. To have self-control. Will you hold your neighbor's hands on your left and right? Just begin to open your mouth and pray for one another. But two or three agree on anything, it shall be done. Open your mouth and pray. Just pray, just pray. Sugar the In the mighty name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, change us. Transform us. Make us more like Jesus. We want to follow you, Lord. We want to imitate you. We want to be like you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a temper problem. Maybe it's, it could be just, just being short-fused. You know, losing your cool. Maybe it's a pornography problem. Maybe there's no self-control. In even simple things like spewing out vulgarities, stuff like that. You know, grieve the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a lack of kindness, lack of forgiveness. Just some people you cannot forgive. Some people you just cannot release that forgiveness and the kindness. Whatever it is. Maybe it's a lack of love. A lack of peace. I want you to zero in that area. I want you to just surrender that to God today. I don't want the service just pass by and, and you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to deal with it. Today you put it on the altar of grace. You say, Jesus, you help me. I surrender. I surrender. Dear Jesus, we bring all our human weaknesses before you. Everything that stands in the way 
stopping us from becoming like Jesus, from following you. We bring it all to your throne right now, right now, right now. We surrender it. We surrender it. Every bad habit, every habitual sin, besetting sin, every temperamental issues, issues of the temperament of personality, we want you to change us. We want you to change us more like Jesus, more of the fruit of the Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus, we surrender it all to you. We surrender it all to you. We surrender it all to you. We bring it all to the altar of grace. We surrender it all to you. From the front to the back, from the left to the right, just talk to God, just talk to Him. Just reach out to Jesus. Something powerful is happening as you do that. God is doing some internal surgery tonight. Go ahead and give God a big clap right now. Hallelujah. 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 